Hey, it's Travis. Parthenogenesis literally means virgin creation or virgin birth. It's an amazing process that happens all the time, yet not many know that it does. Parthenogenesis can happen in a few different ways, but the general outline of it is that a female can produce offspring without a male fertilizing her eggs. Animals that have been known to do this are snakes, lizards, amphibians, fish, insects, turkeys, yet very rarely, and even some mammals when done artificially in a lab. Sounds like a miracle, right? Well, it's not! It's biology, bitch! So, why is this cool? This is cool because a single female can start and sustain a new population. For instance, in 2005 and 2006, two different female Komodo dragons were isolated from males in zoos and underwent parthenogenesis and gave birth to males. Now in the wild, if a sole female were to be swept out into the ocean on driftwood, only to land on an uninhabited Komodo dragonless island, she could undergo parthenogenesis creating male offspring that could then reproduce with their mother and perpetuate a population. Alright, so how exactly does parthenogenesis happen then? First, I need to explain meiosis and how we get our reproductive cells. Don't worry, I'll do it very simply and as quickly as possible. Pay attention. First, the cell replicates and doubles its DNA, causing these single chromosomes to form the X-shaped double chromosome that we're all used to seeing. Once in an X, each single chromosome is now known as a chromatid and are identical. One chromatid for each side of the X-shaped double chromosome. Next, each double chromosome is lined up to its homologous double chromosome, meaning the mother version and the father version of the same chromosome are lined up. Then, crossing over begins. Now is where they will shuffle genetic material with one another, exchanging homologous traits, meaning giving the same traits such as eye color or hair color, and in return receiving eye color or hair color. Take that knowledge I just told you, put it in there. And just remember that. Yeah, I remember it. Oh, yeah. Next, division of the cell occurs and homologous double chromosomes separate. Kaboom, two cells now with half their number of double chromosomes. In this example, we went from six double chromosomes, or three pairs of double chromosomes, to just three non-paired double chromosomes. But note that the double chromosomes are still in an X shape, meaning they still have two chromatids each, ready to split again. Then kapow, division again separating chromatids to make single chromosomes zones, resulting in four cells, each genetically diverse, giving us, in this case, four sperm cells. Okay, let's back up a bit now. Now, in humans, males contain both the X and the Y chromosome. During meiosis, the result is two sperm cells with X chromosome for female, and two cells with the Y chromosome for male. In females, making eggs is the same, except for when the cell divides, and also since females are XX and not XY, all cells would only have the X chromosome. Okay, back up one more time. During the first cell division, the contents of the cell goes into one cell more than the other. This happens again during the next cell division, resulting in one bigger egg and three small cells called polar bodies, which normally degrade and are useless, unless you're a plant, or if you can do parthenogenesis. Now there are three main types of parthenogenesis, automitic, haploid, and apomitic. The first one I'll talk about is automitic. Automictic. Mic automictic. Automatic, and it gets confusing as fuck because it can happen one of several different ways depending on the species. Oh man, don't you hate it when your balls stick to the side of your leg? It was like that the whole time. In 2001 in Nebraska, a bonnethead shark, a type of hammerhead, gave birth in a zoo's tank containing only three females. And in 2002 in Detroit, a white-spotted bamboo shark also gave birth via parthenogenesis. But how? Remember those polar bodies that resulted from female meiosis? Well, one of those will actually function as if it's a sperm cell, restoring diploidy in the egg. 
The haploid egg with half the needed amount of chromosomes, in this case three chromosomes and it needs six, actually fuses with one of the polar bodies resulting in a diploid egg, meaning it now has its original six chromosomes or three pairs and can form a genetically different offspring, not a clone of the mother. This was first observed in 1889 in parthenogenic starfish eggs. Man, my nuts sure are stuck on my leg. Why are they so sticky today? Ah, get off of there. Another way automatic parthenogenesis can happen is by the desert grassland whiptail lizard, or just whiptail for short. In this example, we start with just four single chromosomes, or two pairs of homologous single chromosomes. Now, before meiosis occurs, the cell will double its chromosomes twice, creating four of each homologous double chromosome. Now, normally when this premiotic doubling occurs, homologous double chromosomes will pair off and cross over, and instead of separating, they will actually stay together. Yeah. Together. 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 As meiosis continues, the resulting eggs are genetically different from the mother and are already diploid, aka back to their original four single chromosomes or two pairs of homologous single chromosomes. Now the cell can go right ahead and develop into a genetically different offspring. Simple, right? Well, prepare to be confused. The whiptail lizards do things a little differently and are actually the descendants of two or more different species that long ago hybridized together. This hybridization created a very rich genetic diversity for the whiptail as it gained genes from different species. The whiptail has since maintained this genetic diversity by effectively cloning offspring via parthenogenesis for generation upon generation. How they clone themselves is that after the chromosomes have doubled twice, the sister double chromosomes will pair off instead of the homologous double chromosomes. Now, crossing over does occur between these sister double chromosomes, but because they're genetically identical, it doesn't really change anything genetically. Then as meiosis continues, homologous double chromosomes separate together, just as last time, and the resulting egg is diploid ready to turn into a genetic clone of its mother. These lizards only reproduce asexually, meaning the entire population is female and there are no males. Kind of like a sorority. However, these females do practice pseudocopulation, meaning females will mate with one another while taking turns pretending to be the male. Kind of like a sorority. Doing this seems to promote reproduction. And remember, all these lizards are clones. Kind of like a sorority. But wait a minute. Earlier I talked about how the Komodo dragon can give birth to males via parthenogenesis and perpetuate a species. Why then does this whiptail lizard only give birth to females? This is because of two different sex determination methods, XY and WZ. WZ? WZ sounds cooler. The whiptail lizard, much like humans and other mammals, have an XY sex determination system, where two like chromosomes such as XX are female, resulting in XY being male. So during parthenogenesis, an XX female is only able to produce XX eggs and female offspring. She has no way of getting that Y chromosome and a male cannot be born. Now the Komodo dragon, most other lizards, birds, and snakes have the WZ sex determination system. This is where two like chromosomes, ZZ, are male, resulting in WZ being female. During parthenogenesis, a WZ female is only able to produce ZZ male offspring and WW inviable or non-developmental offspring. Meaning the only way for the double X chromosome Virgin Mary to give birth to the XY male Jesus was if she was actually WZ in... Oh my... Mary and Jesus were actually lizards. It all makes sense now. Speaking of sex determination, this brings us to our second method of how parthenogenesis is done. This is haploid parthenogenesis. And you know who does it? 
Honeybees! Honeybees do not have X, Y, or W, Z sex determination system. Instead, the diploid queen honeybee produces haploid eggs, which are then fertilized by a sperm cell, resulting in diploid female worker bees. If the haploid eggs are left unfertilized, then haploid males will be born. Basically, this haploid condition means that fertilized eggs produce females and unfertilized eggs produce males. Cool. The third major way parthenogenesis is done is by apomitic parthenogenesis. This is another way your genetic clones are made. In this case, meiosis does not occur, only mitosis. So there is no crossing over or reduction of chromosomes. The cell duplicates its DNA, divides once, then the resulting egg develops into an offspring, genetically the same as the mother. A lot of plants do this. Also, a few species of the Timema stick insect have been discovered reproducing this way without any kind of sex for over half a million years. Poor guys. And those are the three main ways that parthenogenesis is done. Now, knowing all this, and knowing that many reptiles and even some birds can reproduce via parthenogenesis, why? Why then, in Jurassic Park, did they explain that the way all the female dinosaurs in the park were able to reproduce was because their DNA gaps were filled in with frog DNA, which allowed the dinosaurs to change sex after they were born because some frogs can? First, no reptiles that I know of can change their sex after they're born. Second, when the gaps in the dinosaur DNA was filled in with frogs DNA, some of the genes that were used would have have to have been those specific genes or perhaps even several thousand genes that enable the frog to change sex. What is the probability of accidentally using all the genes that are needed to have the trait of being able to change sex? Plus, all those genes used would have have to have come from a frog that can actually change its sex, like the common reed frog. It would have been way easier and more realistic for the movie just to explain how a lot of reptiles can undergo parthenogenesis. Yeah, and you know that scene in the movie where Dr. Malcolm is talking to John and Dr. Wu about how life uh, finds a way? Well, that scene would have went like this. Well, how do you know all the dinosaurs in the park are female? We control their chromosomes. It's really not that difficult. Yeah. All vertebrate embryos are inherently female anyway. They just require an extra hormone given at the right developmental stage to make them male. But we simply deny them that. Deny them that? John, that kind of control you're attempting is, uh, it's not possible. Listen, if the history of evolution has taught us anything, is that life cannot be contained. Life breaks free, it expands new territories, crashes through barriers, painfully, maybe even dangerously, but, uh, uh, well, there it is. There it is. You're implying that a group composed entirely of female animals will breed? F yeah, that's what I'm saying. It happens all the time. Life has a way already. Well, crap. <laughs> well, there's actually a lot wrong with Jurassic Park, but that's just one more thing to think about. Okay, bye! Hey, thanks for watching. Be sure to share, like, comment, subscribe. Now, I'm actually down in Boca Raton, Florida, a beautiful city. There's too many old people here. Anyways, this might be my last video for a while because I'm down here doing a research project in the Everglades, and then I'm going to California to work on another one there. So I probably won't have time to make another one of these videos. I'm trying to film like a day in the life of a research technician type thing, but I don't know if any of the footage will see the light of day. So, yeah.